All set? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I think if you saw the uh, advertisement for this, you probably wondered what the heck. So we got a telephone in Albion. Big deal. Uh, no, it was a big deal. The, where I found it, I was researching something else. And there was this notice that in, I think it's telephony, but it's telephony magazine, okay? February 4th, 1939. The first dial telephones were installed at Albion, New York in 1896. And I thought, the first one's in Albion. I, not Rochester, not Buffalo, not Albany, but Albion. So I got my curiosity up, wanted to know why Albion was chosen. Um, and so I did some digging, of course. Um, and in researching this, I found the names of some of the, of one particular man that helped to get the phone established here. So I did some research on him. Come to find out this all connects to the Pullman Universalist Church. Okay? Um, when I searched, the first reverend was Reverend Dr. Charles Fleur, F-L-U-H-R-E-R. -E he was a classmate of James Pullman at St. Lawrence University in Canton Theological School. And he was considered to be a fine scholar and a wonderful preacher and a sy sympathetic minister. He was also the brother-in-law of George's younger sister, Emma. So Emma Pullman Fleur. So the Fleurs and the Pullmans were connected through marriage. Okay, one knew the other, and the Pullmans and the Fleurs went to college together. <clears throat> so that was the connection with the, the Fleurs. Um, Charles Fleur was the first minister at the Pullman Universalist Church. He uh, went to Albion in 1894 to take up the Pullman Memorial Church at the strong desire of the late George Pullman. So it was essentially George Pullman picking the first minister at the Universalist Church, someone whom he knew from college days, was a connection there. Um, Dr. Charles Fleur, the first minister at the Universalist Church, died here in Albion and is buried in Mount Albion. Now, they, he was uh, born in Providence, Rhode Island, but he spent a large majority of his life here. So he and his family are buried in Mount Albion. Um, he was the father of Howard Fleur. Now this is where we get the connection. <laughs> um, Howard Fleur was born in New York City. He was the son of Charles. Most of his youth was spent in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He entered the employ of the Western Union Telegraph Company at the age of 17. In 1895, he installed the first automatic telephone exchange in Albion, New York. Now, I think all these connections of the minister, the minister's son, um, the minister's son being involved in the, the um, telephone exchange, this is where I started to see tie-ins. Um, it says that he was always interested in electricity, and in 1895, he was called to Albion to install the first automatic telephone exchange in New York State. This was the year in which his father began his pastorate in Albion. In 1899, he went to Auburn as manager of the automatic telephone company for a period of 13 years. So <clears throat> you get the Universalist Church, the first minister, the first minister's son, um, and the minister's son is the one who's interested in the telephone and how it works. Now, before we had this kind of phone, you had all the girls 
sitting in, taking the call, connecting it to your next, okay? That, and listening. And listening in, yes. And giving wrong directions. Um, because one of the things that caused this singular telephone to be developed was a man named Stroger who was interested in the telephone, but he was a funeral director. And he was a funeral director, he was a Penfield native. He would use the basic phone, call the operator, have the operator call. So would his clients, he was a funeral director. He found out that some of the girls on the exchange would take a message from somebody saying they wanted Mr. Stroger's funeral home and the girl would connect them with a competitive funeral home, which kind of ticked him off. So he decided he was gonna find a way where people could contact him personally and not have to go through those girls because they weren't doing their job very well. So he was at home putting things together trying to come up with an individual telephone that you could use to call the other person. And this is how the phone got started, was because a funeral director got pissed <laughs> about the girls waylaying his, res his telephone messages and requests to a different one. Um, Stroger's device consisted of buttons, a collar tap to signal the desired number to a central switch, and a rotating arm at the center switch that moved the caller's line until it was in contact with the desired number. Stroger designed each unit to make a large number of lines available and to be combinable to a scale dramatically without increasing complexity. The first automatic telephone exchange was installed in LaPorte, Indiana in 1892. That's the first exchange that Stroger pushed to get through. Um, and that was more of an individual thing. Um, Stroger was interested in getting established these individual telephones where anybody could call anybody else instead of having to go through these girls that messed up the messages anyway. Um, and so he designed his phone. Um, on the, uh, it was in August 20th of 1896 that the Stroger Automatic Telephone Exchange Company submitted a patent for the telephone rotary dial. Uh, the telephone, we had a picture on the advertisement for my talk, but it came in different forms. And this was the first individual telephone. They, you could stick your finger in there and make the dial go around. Where before, you had to take a hold of like a little bead that stuck out and you move it around. Take another bead and you move it around. Where this had the holes, which were easier to manage than having your fingers slip off of it. Is that the one that was first on? Yeah, that's the kind of phone that was here. Um, and they developed the, the box looking phone too at that time. Uh, so actually, the, the individual phone was a dramatic change in the phones because before you could just pick it up and somebody would talk to you on the phone and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have any connection whatsoever with them. Where this made it a little more personal um, I looked at the history of telephones. Um, phones started out as novelty items shown just to kings and queens. Okay? Today, they are something almost everybody carries, of course, even the homeless. In 1914, at the start of World War I, there were 10 people for every working telephone in the U.S. By the end of World War II in 1945, there were five people for every working telephone. 
and technology passed a key milestone in 1998 when there was a phone for every man, woman, and child in the United States. In 2017, there were 455 million telephone numbers for the United States, 325 million residents. So, a few of us had more than one phone number, like we do now. I have a cell phone, I have my home phone, which you can get me down here on the library phone. How many phone numbers could be connected to one person? And there's three right there. And I'm not a techie. <laughs> but I can, can say you can contact me three different ways. Um, there was an article, I think Bill Latin did, probably. Um, for, or maybe it was Matt Ballard. Um, he, had, he showed a brick building on the north side of East Bank Street in Albion at the present site of Phoenix Fitness. This was done a few years ago. In the years following the photograph, the office served as the telephone building prior to its relocation on Pratt Street. So Bank Street, Pratt Street was where the telephone exchanges eventually developed. <clears throat> I think it's interesting to, to look in the newspaper and see what was being talked about on these um, phones. In 1877, now this is 20 years before that first phone was made, an exchange says a very cheap sort of telephone can be made by taking two small round tin boxes and passing a strong string through a hole made in the bottom <laughs> of each, securely fastened by a knot. It will make no difference whether the string is 20 feet or 20 rods long. If drawn tightly and one end is held to the mouth of the speaker and the other to the ear of the listener, the faintest whisper can be instantly heard with perfect distinction. It is a curious, pleasing experiment and well worth trying. Well, that's 20 years before we had the telephone. But I remember as a kid doing that. It was still popular. Um, that was in the Medina Journal, July 26, 1877. In 1896, it, even in the Brockport papers, it said, Albion proposes to try an automatic telephone system. That was in July of 1896, so we were up there in the Brockport reported. Albion's automatic telephone exchange will start in with 60 patrons. So they got 60 people to, to buy into this automatic telephone exchange. Albion's new automatic telephone line is now in full operation and it is working nicely. This is in October 22nd, 1896. The novelty of this new system consists in each patron being his own central, doing his own switching and reaching other patrons of the line by his own manipulations. So you didn't need somebody else doing it for you. Once you had this telephone, you could do those things for yourself. <clears throat> and in the weekly news, it said, the new automatic telephone is now in use in Albion. It's giving general satisfaction and many is the time that subscribers are rung up only to be told that someone merely wished to see how the thing worked. <laughs> <laughs> or that they called the wrong number. <laughs> the new automatic phone line is now in full operation. Patron is being his own central. What a remarkable day. Um, Western New York Telephone Company was incorporated in February of 1898 to operate a telephone system in Buffalo and in the cities and villages of the counties of Erie, Niagara, and Orleans, Genesee, Cattaraugus, and Chautauqua. The automatic system will probably be used. <laughs> uh, this was in 1898, so two years after we got the phone. They're talking about moving it into counties at a time. 
The Western New York Telephone Company has recently incorporated and has a stock of 500,000 to operate the telephone system in Buffalo and adjoining counties. The following persons have recently placed telephones in their places of business. W.J. Cooper, J.W. and F.J. Frary, A.E. Ritter, Grocers, Law Office of Simons and Mohamedou, Medina Furniture Company. Application has been made for telephones by H.G. Spore, Grocer, and by the A.L. Sweat Electric Power Company. So this was in 1899, so three years after the first phone. It's spreading like wildfire so that you could have your own phone and contact people personally. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to end this with a story I found in the Medina paper that I think is great. It was in June of 1896. Our telephone didn't get put in until October, but I think this is really cute. An old man would not believe he could hear his wife talk a distance of five miles by telephone. His better half was in a country shop several miles away, where there was a telephone. And the skeptic was also in a place where there was a similar instrument. And on being told how to operate it, he walked boldly up and shouted, Hello, Sarah! At that instant, lightning struck the telephone wire and knocked the man down. <laughs> And as he scrambled to his feet, he excitedly cried, that is Sarah, every inch. <laughs> well, I, I hope it was a little entertaining. Um, it was just amazing to me to find that Albion, and it was the, in saying it was the first telephone, it was the first individual telephone in New York State. And I still think that's remarkable. And I, I, I believe it was the second one after the court, so it was the second one in the United States. In the United States, yes. I, I've understood through different sources yeah. that one of the reasons they chose Albion was because it was the right market. Yes. The, the company that eventually became the home telephone company in Albion was aligned with Rochester Telephone, and they did not want to roll out Rochester Telephone's dial service on East Avenue and piss everybody off. Mm -hmm. They wanted to see it work. And this, because of the interconnections of people. The other thing that, that I always found interesting is in that 1905 Village of Albion book yeah. that we all have an old copy right. of, most of the ads, this two phone cover, two phones, yeah. the bell phone and the home phone, <clears throat> the bell system started buying up phones. Right. Almost from the time the patent was granted in 1875, they figured out that being the big guy on the block was where the real money was. And there, so they were national rules. And the rule was you never, ever interconnected with a local phone company. So if you had a bell phone, you could call bell customers. If you had a home phone, you could call home customers. But you had to have two. So it's interesting, the ones that have two, are the grocers, the funeral directors. Yes. A lot of folks only had one. And if you didn't have the right phone, then you stopped in the sea. You, had a, certain, you had a certain level where you couldn't go beyond. The other thing which I, I found interesting is that the long distance connection, which didn't start to be an issue until about 1904 or five, oh, yeah. that was a cost to the local phone company. Yeah. They had to pay AT&T what later became Bell Long Lines, to have a circuit come in from one of the big central offices, Buffalo Rochester. So there was only, like Albion, there was only one. Only one person could make it out of Albion phone call at one time because the local phone company was paying to have that line. And if it wasn't used all the time, they weren't interested. Yep, and that idea of, of the user having to pay extra was still around when I was a kid. Because in making a phone call, I can remember my folks going, don't talk too long. You've only got five minutes or something like that. Because you got charged for all the extra time you were on that phone past a certain amount. Now, I don't know what the certain amount was, but remember that? And the rates were yeah. lower after a certain period of time. After a certain period of time, the rates were up and you had to, and as a kid, I can remember my mother saying, you haven't got much time, can I wrap this up, you know? So, 
Yeah, the telephone went by spurts and jerks. I mean, here, yes, we had the first telephone in New York State. And that's what cleared it up because I'm thinking the first one in the United States. And then as well, the more. It was, the same, it was for the same reason. Right. Elman Stroger, who invented the Stroger switch, yeah. who was the, the, the funeral director. Right. He was based in either Chicago or Chicago summer. Right. In Some place area. where the exchanges were big and where it was easy for the girls to say, oh, this guy's giving me four bucks, so all the dead yeah. balls go over here. <laughs> yep. And, and he got together with people from Western Electric. And I'm inclined to think, although I don't know that, that it was like it used to be at Kodak. We all knew people who worked in the machine shop at Kodak. So if you needed something, something special, you ask your buddy, the next time you got some time, mm -hmm. he had friends at Western Union, the right. telegraph company, who actually made his, his original, his, his, the pat, I've seen the patent application, and it literally is, it's with pins, pins and needles, needles and buttons, yes. and, 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 and shirt collars, and, yep, he yeah. just put it together out of pieces at home, to is what prove it did, that make it work. to prove that he could make one, and that it could be made. But they were looking for a, a, a small community. And Laporte, I don't know that much about the demographics then, but Laporte apparently was a place where people had money. So if you could prove that it worked, they all want one. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what you want for your, your, right. your beta test, is not somebody who's going to say, oh, well, I never made any phone calls. Or, yeah. That's, that's the, yeah, well, the, but and, and also that, but also these influential people were connected to wanting the telephone. It's like Howard Floor, the minister's mm -hmm. son. He was most interested in that. He didn't live his whole life here, although he's buried in Mount Elgin. The people that I, I spoke of, they're all buried in Mount Elgin. But um, he was here for a short period of time when he was teen to 20, and then he was gone. <clears throat> but the influential people, George Pullman, the, his father, who was the first minister himself, um, they all were connected with bigger people in the community and in Rochester area. Um, and I do believe that there was an incentive, although I haven't found it yet, to using Albion for it. Because I'm sorry, when I first looked at it, I thought, Albion, the first one in New York State? Why Albion? I mean, you got Albany. Albany should have been touting the very first phone in New York State. But if it didn't work in Albany, they they never be able to sell another one. If right, but you, Albany, you still got Rochester and Buffalo. You still got big cities where they could have claimed it. And I know there was some, but there were influential people here who pushed it. I think. To and have I also found it ironic that this was the first place for the dialogue. This and then the home phone company. Right. because the bell company literally drove <coughs> well, all these companies out of business. They were the big guy. They, they were the big bully. And so it wasn't until 1962, when I was in the second grade, that we did away with the operator assistance. Yeah. And, and people don't, it, it, it's funny because it's part of the tour when they do Cub Scouts at the 911, because 911, it tells you where you are, if you're on a cell phone, it gives us right. the latitude and longitude. We're now down to, I can tell within 12 feet where your cell phone is. Mm -hmm. We're not, we, we, out here, we're not real good at the, the, the altitude, but like in the city, they can tell you that you're on the 34th floor of the building yeah. at such and such and such. Well, we used to be able to do that. I can remember picking up the phone and saying, can you find my dad? And they would knew they would know that it was coming from the authorities' house, and that obviously, if I was allowed to use the phone, I'm supposed to do that. So they would check his office, they would check the courthouse, and they would check the legion. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and now, now we've got billions of dollars worth of equipment to be able to identify where you're calling from. Right. And they knew where I was calling from. They knew I was calling from State Street because yep. it showed up in the middle of the lake. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and I can remember growing up, being up to my dad's folks. My dad's parents lived in the country, they were farmers. <clears throat> and I must have been about four years old, my mother tells this story. Says, I was up and stayed on the weekend to grandma and grandpa's. And when I got home, my mother said, so, how did you like staying at grandma and grandpa's? Did you have a good time? What did you do? 
And I looked at her and I said, Mom, Grandma talks on the phone, but she don't say nothing. <laughs> Grandma was listening on the phone to get all the news of the community because she, you know, one ring was so-and-so's, two yeah, rings was right. yours, three rings was somebody else. Yeah. Well, Grandma picked it up whether it was hers or not. And she was holding her hand on the phone, and I remember going, shh, don't shh. And she listened. <laughs> so there were lots of uses for the telephone. When we were in Eagle Harbor, we moved into town before I started kindergarten. So that was, that was when I was five. So before that, we were out in what was one of the Robinson Horse Farm tent houses. And we were on a 12 party line out there. And we were two longs in a short. Uh, there you go. And But Herb Dawson's mom, who was I mean, one of those sweet people, she's 110 for as long as I can remember. <laughs> she knew everything that was going on yep. in the Harbor. I mean, there was nothing that you were going to do. That's right. That's right. You listen just right, you know what's going on. And besides that, my grandmother would watch out the window. And her daughter, <laughs> two lived, two daughter lived across the street. And my aunt and uncle sold strawberries. They were farmers. So if she saw a car pull in, my grandmother would call my my uh, aunt and say, who's that? I've never seen that car in your driveway before. <laughs> so grandma kept up with what was going on, even though she didn't drive and didn't, you know, didn't go anywhere. And my, my mother-in-law, Bill's mother, was the same way. My mother-in-law, my husband and I say, it's a very good thing that his family and my family did not come from the same town. Because <laughs> there wouldn't be much town left. His mother could tell, I'll tell you the thing that blew me away. He said one day the phone rang, his mother answered it, and it was the post office asking her where somebody moved because they couldn't find them. Now they called my mother-in-law from the post office. Now, see, that's awful close to my grandmother listening on the phone. <laughs> so that telephone has caused problems, <laughs> but it's also been an interesting life, especially with us seeing the different changes in a phone from being just at home. And you have to listen to how many rings it is before you can pick it up uh, to now carrying your phone with you and having messages and all that. I, it's just amazing how far it's come. Anybody else? Well, thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's right. They built the building 